Well, warm greetings to everyone. Happy to see you here. In fact, our crowd has grown a bit from day to day. Uh, I think we've gotten more than even Mr. Trent anticipated by a few anyway. We're happy to see all of you. Anyway, it was mentioned in the, uh, by the song leader and in the announcements that uh, today is the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles. But as all of you know, or most of you at least, tomorrow is called that last great day, or great day of the feast, John 7, uh, 37. And it will be the eighth day of the group of, a, of a seven annual holy days. Gets a bit confusing, but you'll learn how it is observed. Now, God has given these days to, for us to observe, and the entire feast, all the eight days, depicts hope. So I guess if you want a simple title for this sermon will be Hope. There's not a lot of hope in this present evil world, as you know. And our modern news media has the technology to gather news and information from every corner of this globe. But how much good news are you hearing on those programs? Sophisticated, well-informed individuals, I'll have to admit that, but it brings us reports about various happenings and events around the world. We get information about mainly the continuing war, but on a local scale, and on my local news here in Knoxville, Tennessee, wretched human government. You get horrible accidents reported, not every day, but a lot of days. Sickening growth in crime and evil. You'll be hearing about these things, of course, in the Bible study uh, tonight. And especially those involving the rape, the mutilation, and murder of helpless children. And even the so-called Christian organization is fraught with pedophiles from end to end. All they make overtures toward having a fix for it. They're not going to fix it. It was set up wrong to begin with. Man was not meant to live alone, as God's word said. But these men have turned into pedophiles, and it's sickening. Lawsuits are popping up here and there, and it, it makes me sick. On CNN News this very morning, um, I believe he's an um, attorney general, maybe of Michigan, and he had spoken out against a certain openly homosexual in a, in a college there. And this lady newscaster was getting on his case about this. He didn't think she ought to do that. You know, we all have a right to our lifestyle. They've got a right to the cremation that happens at the end if they don't repent of it. That's the right to have. But anyway, we live in an ugly, evil world. The Bible gives us dire warnings where all these events are eventually going to lead up to. Most of us sitting here today are familiar with what Bible prophecy reveals about mankind's future. In fact, if there were no God, and there is a great and perfect God, as was mentioned a couple of times already this morning, there would be no future. With no God, there's no future. You might as well learn to live with that. Matthew 24, 21, I'll just read you this. We'll not turn to our youth may. Matthew 24 and verse 21, For then shall be great trouble, great tribulation, such was, as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. And there's been some horrific times in this world since the beginning uh, from the Garden of Eden and proceeding forward. No nor ever shall be, verse 22 tells us, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. No flesh be saved alive, as one translation gives it. But for the elect's sake, you think we're not important to this world? Oh, they look upon us with disdain today, but they'll be wanting to cling to us eventually. Say, you, you have the answers. We've heard about you, but we never put any confidence, and most of the things were derogatory and bad things about you. Well, they'll be seeking us real quickly. We're going to be in real deep trouble when that happens. Goes on to say, 
There should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And you can rest assured that's going to happen. We have that hope. So here is that sure hope that I mentioned as the title of the sermon that we can have as God's elect, God's people. Not anything good we've ever done. I think I've made every mistake in the book. But he had mercy and he had love. And he chose us everyone singularly and gave us a place that we might obtain eternal life. So here's that sure hope that we have as God's elect if there's qualifications to it, of course. Such a great reward if we remain faithful because verse 13 of Matthew 24 tells us, after it tells us the preaching of the gospel is going to go out to the whole world, it says, but he that shall endure to the end shall be saved. A future condition. You're in a saved condition whenever you're begotten of God's Spirit, but eventually you shall be as has been put so well here many times, born again, becoming a spirit being with the powers and the body and the composition of God himself as one of his children. But what about the rest of the world? Those that are said to be deceived by one, Satan the devil. You can read about that in Revelation 12, 9. Tells us he's deceived the whole world. Not just a few but the whole world lies in deception. What about the fate of physical Israel, where Romans 11 tells us we'll turn there. Now, God has a purpose in this and his great plan uh, depicted by his holy days. Romans, the 11th chapter, you may be familiar with it. <clears throat> we'll read about two or three verses here. Romans 11, we'll pick it up in verse 7 for the first one, first reference. What then, Paul asks, Israel has not obtained that which he seeketh for. No, he does not have salvation or what he seeks for. But there, are, there is a group of people who has obtained it. They're called the election, as was mentioned earlier. The elect, for the elect's sake, the election hath obtained it. And we don't have to get out here and uh, try to get elected to some office like these poor politicians have to do, uh, lie and scheme and, and have bribes and everything given to them. The election hath obtained it. We're in that state. But the rest were blinded. Now, who allowed this blindness? Satan is the main key instrument in it. But who allows it? According as it is written, God... God hath given them the spirit of slumber. Remember the ten virgins there, they were all asleep. But God has given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear. I'm speaking on a spiritual level. Most of you can see well. Some have difficulties, of course, as we see, having to wear heavy glasses and all that. And ears that they should not hear unto this day. You could couple that with uh, Matthew 13, where it says, Blessed are your eyes, for they see. And blessed are your ears, for they hear. They understand. They perceive the truth. All right. <clears throat> These are questions that we want to address and answer today. Is there hope? For all these people, some whom Satan has deliberately and, and uh, first person deceived, but also God, according to his plan and purpose, has allowed these things, but for a great purpose, that he might eventually have mercy upon all. So God is perfect. He's, he's flawless. There's no uh, problem with him in any way. I'm going to read this a little bit later on in the sermon. I first included it up front here, but uh, you'll be waiting for it. It'll be in Jeremiah 30, but it couples with the next chapter, and I want to put them together after reviewing the notes last night. I thought, I think this would be better said by reversing this order, and I hope it comes out clearer to you. All right. talks about these terrible times that are ahead of us there in Jeremiah 30. I'll just uh, let you know in advance there. 
but it talks about this great tribulation is primarily directed toward God's chosen people. It is even a time of Jacob's trouble. And we'll get into that a bit deeper later on. I will insert this, and it makes me nothing, but I've had the opportunity and have the information given from past groups that I've been associated with about the blessings of Abraham is the title of it. And it tells where we came from, what prophecy predicts for us in the future. But if you'll request our free publication from our headquarters, The Blessings of Abraham, if you've not received that yet, from our church headquarters, Church of God, New World Ministries, Post Office Box 5536, Sevierville, Tennessee, 37864. That's mainly for the benefit of those who will be watching this later on on DVD, hopefully. Our phone number is 865, area code 774-8485. You can find our website, www.cognwm, New World Ministries. I want to stress that, by the way, because there are other groups in this area. And some of them have had the audacity, I can speak stronger, of coming by where they find we're having a certain meeting or something and leaving their literature and trying to draw away disciples after themselves. And I'm familiar with these people. In fact, I wrote them uh, a letter of resignation. So did all the ministry at one time, not too far in the past, because it be seemed to be very greedy, very uh, wanting to control everything, and it was, not their it was not their job to do that. But they are fishing, you might say. Just be aware of that. You can go anywhere you want. That's fine. You make up your own mind. I had to make up my own mind. But on the other hand, if they do it in a devious way, then I think that is a wrong. All right. But anyway, if you get this book, or manuscript, Blessings of Abraham you will be able to prove to yourself that the English-speaking people of the world are, and I brought this out in another sermon, they're sort of tied together, the modern-day house of Israel of your Bible are mainly the English-speaking people of the world. There are a few, like we believe Reuben uh, is France, who would speak French, of course, and all that, but mainly the sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. The blessings fell on these young lads' heads, and that's who we came from. All right, why? Why would God allow such suffering and punishment to come upon modern-day Israel, or Jacob, and Judah together? Isn't the United States of America, and probably Britain with their Church of England, by the way, the Pope's been over there visiting, sort of making over tours toward that group, trying to draw them back into the fold, and he'll eventually approach every religious order on this earth, but anyway, aren't we the most Christianized people of the world? God says, no, we are not the most Christian nation. We have a facade, but we are not true Christians. Look at some of the descriptive titles that he labels us with. Let's go to Mark 7. <clears throat> Mark 7. And he tells us up front what we are. God in his word does. Let's begin reading. That's where they had condemned Christ there because he ate with what they thought was unwashed hands. Well, it was a ceremonial washing, actually. Then the Pharisees, verse 5, and the scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, to the tradition, but eat bread with unwashing hand. And he answered and said unto them, Well has Isaiah prophesied of you, hypocrites. Is that what he looks upon us as? What he says, just a modern day, as it is written, and this comes from Isaiah 29, verse 13. I believe I mentioned this in the a former sermon. As it is written, the people honoreth me with their lips. All oh, they, you hear them in these phraseologies, religious terminology. Do you know the Lord, brother? Do you love the Lord? 
Is your heart, have you given your heart to the Lord? Mr. Armstrong used to speak and it would make people very angry. He said, do you reach into your chest cavity and pull out your heart and give it to the Lord? He could be very strong in uh, putting it in that type manner. As it is written, the army with their lips, but their heart, their heart, their innermost being, the way they think, the way they act is far from me. And so he says, how be it? In vain. I gave a sermon some time back. Do you worship God in vain? Could it include some of God's people? How be it? In vain do they worship me. Yes, they bow down. They say prayers. They have invocations and all that type thing. They baptize in various ways. Some may sprinkle a little water on them. Some of them are just babes. Some of them, they uh, have learned the proper way to immerse because it is a, a death, a spiritual death. When you're put into the baptismal pool and covered, your sins at that moment are taken away. And when you come out of that baptismal pool, you are at that moment clean enough now through the laying on of hands of the, ministries, of the ministry to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that will give you a new dimension of understanding, a new dimension of life. You'll find out. All right. They worship him in vain, everyone except God's true flock, the elect. Teaching for doctrines. Oh, they have all these doctrines, as we have doctrines. But it says we're to continue in the faith once delivered, that set of doctrines. Teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Now, what are some of these commandments? Well, you should observe Christmas and Easter and uh, Sunday. No, that's not what God says. He says the seventh day is reserved for the Sabbath day. It's set apart, sanctified. You cannot exchange the Sabbath for Sunday. That is the mark of the beast. And God said you'd better not receive that unless you want to receive his plagues. Going on, for laying aside, verse 8, the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups. And of course, they had learned this uh, procedure as they came out of Babylon there and devised their religion, trying to uh, be better than God, frankly. The washing of pots and cups and many other such things as you do, and was brought out, I believe, uh, in a former sermon here by Mr. Schuster, about all that they had devised. You walk so many uh, miles on the Sabbath and things like that. It doesn't say that in the Bible. It doesn't give any certain distance. But they had devised these things. Well, this will make us holier than anyone else. Self-righteousness is what it is. Verse 9. Full well. Totally, completely. You reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. And that is certainly true in the Protestantism. Not just Jewish people, Protestants, Catholics. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And here they try to get around that by making excuses. And uh, Moses said, and whoso curseth father, curses father and mother, let him die the death. Very serious offense. And I see some of these young folks, really, they would throw me in prison if I even uttered the, the condemnation. That boy needs to be put to death. Back then, God says, kill that child if he is rude and sasses his parents to the degree who curses his father and mother. Let him die the death. A death penalty hung over them. But you say, if a man shall say to his father and mother, well, I'd help, help you out, Dad. I know you're on a pension. You don't have much income. Uh, but I'm really, I've got my money dedicated already to the temple. It's Corbin. I've already got my money uh, taken care of. Or I would help you out. But God says to honor your mother and your father and your mother by it is Corbin. That is to say a gift. By whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. He shall be free. Well you're excused from that if you have a legitimate excuse. But it's not legitimate. And you suffer him no more to do aught or anything for his father or his mother. And making the word of God 
of none effect through your tradition which you have delivered and many such things like things you do. Now then, let's go on down here. I believe I'll stop there on this particular part of the sermon because I do want to be able to finish in time and I'll depend on Mr. Trent. He gives me certain signals and some of them are something like this. <laughs> All right. Another gross sin that God accuses us of, and I mentioned it earlier about what I saw on CNN this very morning, accuses us of or equates us with the ancient cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He destroyed two whole cities. And the way he did it, it might have been so akin to an atomic power blast that, that burned them to a crisp, destroyed every person there except Lot, who did escape with his two daughters and his wife originally, but she did what he told her not to do. She looked back. She had the, a desire to continue in that lifestyle or she had just been, become so hardened and inured to it that she thought, well, so what? Let everybody do his own thing. That's all right. That's their choice. Yes, it is their choice. But there's coming a judgment day someday. Don't believe there isn't. Going on then, let's see what scripture I want to turn to here. <clears throat> Let's turn to the book of Isaiah. I've got a couple of chapters here I want to touch on. Isaiah, the very first chapter. Fits our society to a T. Uh, if you read what they're saying, just like that lady news uh, person, an analyst, I guess you would call her, but she wanted to condemn this fellow, because, this attorney general, because he had said bad things about this openly gay college student. Well, again, they're going to have to learn the difference in male and female someday and rightly apply it. Isaiah 1 and verse 5. God asked the question, Why should you be stricken anymore? Why do you keep pounding your head against that wall? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. Yes, our leadership is like that. From the sole of the foot, even under the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. You get real apt in your description. I don't want to get, you know, uh, about too bad about those things. They have not been closed, these sores, these boils and things like that, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Let me see if I can find exactly. I want to pick up one particular verse. Let's go to, let me see if I've got this down exactly like I want. Well, chapter 3. Well, verse 9. Let's get verse 9 while we're here in this particular page. And except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. So there's a likening to our sins as Sodom and Gomorrah. Now then, they were totally destroyed without a person whom he did not allow to escape, being uh, Abraham's nephew Lot and his family. But he says, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, you peoples of Gomorrah. Yes, they need to read some of the Old Testament scriptures that pertain to this particular sin. That man will not lie with a man as with a woman. Is that plain enough and vice versa? Got one openly uh, being that way, a female. Great celebrity in this land, allowed to go on camera and... Uh, parade her virtues or act lack of virtues, she ought to be put off the stations. I feel very strongly about that because I see what it has caused in this nation. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices with your false worship, saith the Lord? I'm full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks, nor of lamb, or of he-goats. Going on, 
because of verse 13, being bring no more vain oblations or offerings to me, vain. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. I can't tolerate it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. And it says, your new moon, your new moon's not mine. And your appointed feasts, now we can, we can observe some feasts, like Thanksgiving. That's within the laws of God and the desires of God. Your appointed feasts, like the others I mentioned, my soul, God says he hates it. They are a trouble unto me. I'm weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands and worship, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear your hands are full of blood. Um, there's a particular verse. I seemingly my eyes will not fall on it right now, but eventually, hopefully it will happen. But um, because of these sins, we're going to be uh, wiped out practically. There will be about 10% remaining. It says as in a hundred, ten would return. In a thousand, maybe a hundred. About ten percent God is going to spare of this great population. So you can see the magnitude of the punishment that's going to come upon this people. Let's turn to chapter 3. I believe this is one I was looking for. Isaiah 3 and in verse uh, 9. Notice how this is being fulfilled in our modern day. The show of their countenance doth witness against them. And they declare their sin. They talk about it. They openly discuss it. They come out of the closet. They declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. It was something that was secretive. And I hardly knew about it in my youth. In fact, it wasn't even uh, my father. I don't believe I ever heard him mention this particular thing to be aware of. Because it just was not done. It wasn't even talked about. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. In Romans, the first chapter, I believe it is, receiving unto themselves a recompense, full payment of what they're doing. So it speaks, some will argue, some of these people, that, well, it may say that in the Old Testament. It doesn't refer to it in the New. They're totally ignorant of the facts and of the Bible. Totally ignorant. But anyway... They will receive the recompense of their error, it tells us. Now, this is not just a sermon about this particular sin, but it does. It's one of the most gross sins in our nation at this time. All right, let's go back to Isaiah. Um, let's see where I'm at now. Because of this, Isaiah 10, let's turn to this scripture. And this gives us, the nation who will carry out this punishment because they are a mighty nation. Starts off in verse 5, chapter 10 of Isaiah. O Assyrian, I may have made mention of this in the earlier sermon, the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. I will send him against an hypocritical nation. Here's twice in the new and the old that God calls us a a hypocritical nation. And that's what we are. We have a facade of worship, but it's wrong. And against the people of my wrath. Some people, well, God is a God of love always. He wouldn't have all this wrath, would he? Would he send this nation against uh, his own people? Will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire in the streets? We've went to... Uh, through two world wars with these same people about 1918, 1921 and then in our World War II I guess beginning about 1945 I was a, a 15 year old boy at that time no it ended in 45 but it started 41 but anyway they have almost beat us twice this third time they will be able to conquer us because God is going to allow it because of our evil and the way we try to worship him. He means not so, neither does his heart think so. But it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. I think the Europeans are right now having a major discussion, a meeting over there about their finances and things like that that was on the news this morning as well. 
Albeit he means not so, neither did his heart think so, but it is in his heart, I brought this out, that he is a war-making nation. To destroy and cut off nations are not a few. All right, let's go then to... Uh, We, we do not worship God as he commanded there. I've quoted you this before. In John 4, verse 23 and 24, you can just put it in your notes, that we must worship God in spirit and in truth. And he told that, Christ told that Samaritan woman that she didn't know what, how she worked. You worship, you know not what. But said, we, were, we know what we worship. But anyway, he says we must worship in spirit and in truth, John 4, 23, and 24. Moving on then to, um, I'll finish up on this right here about what I was speaking of earlier. These people have the audacity to call this gay pride. And it's not just the American way of life. The Jewish people also are uh, in this very involved, very deeply involved. They call it gay pride, but Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride cometh before destruction. So they can call it gay pride. They're hitting the very word that pictures what they are about. In fact, it even looks like the Supreme Court may allow, it's in the offing right now, may allow every state in the Union, not passed yet, to sanction same-sex marriages before this push for equal rights is over. And I quoted to you Amos, Amos 5 and 3 tells you about the 10% that would return from the punishment of what they're going to, the severity of it. About 10%. And you get to figuring that on our population. Excuse me. <clears throat> and it's going to be horrendous. <clears throat> now some of the, um, excuse me again. <clears throat> Horrors and the results of our sinful conduct are graphically de uh, described in two chapters of your Bible. You'll want to read these. Uh, if you can handle it, it'll make you very sick sometime. Le Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. I'll just have time to re read you very little of this. But it gets really horrible. <clears throat> Leviticus 26. First of all, he tells us, uh, verse 3, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them, then I'll give you rain in due season and the land shall yield her increase. The trees of the field shall yield her fruit and all these good things. But you drop on down then to verse uh, 14. Here is what is going to take place and I do not see it happening at all. Anywhere. The repenting of this nation. But if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments and if you despise my statutes or if your soul abhor my judgments so that you will not do all my commandments but that you break my covenant then he says I will do these things to you. I will appoint over you terror. Isn't that one of our main uh, uh, problems here in this country? Try to get on an airplane and see how much scrutiny you will go through because of terrorists. Terror, consumption, degenerative diseases of the lungs, I guess. The burning ague, I don't know what that involved. That shall consume your eyes and shall cause sorrow of heart, and you'll sow your seed in vain. You won't reap these great harvests any longer, for your enemies shall eat it once they invade and take over. They will eat what we have grown. And I will set my face against you, you shall be slain before your enemies, they that hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when none pursues you. I'll break the pride of your power. Verse 19, I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. Great drought going to happen. He goes on to talk about that he's going to uh, increase these sevenfold many times. Verse 28, I will walk contrary unto you in great in fury. And I, even I, will chastise you seven times, or seven times in, times in intensity, for your sin. I go to Deuteronomy 20, 28, reiterate some of these very same punishments, and it gets really sickening. You, you think, well, I don't think, I would never do that. I don't know of anyone else that would ever do that. 
Well, that's what God says will happen. Verse 1 of Deuteronomy tells the same thing, that if we'd obey God and keep his commandments, that all would be well with us. But on the other hand, we could drop down to verse 15. <clears throat> And again, a lot of this may be covered this evening. And it will be well worthwhile for us to see what can happen because God is wrathful. Deuteronomy 28 verse 15. No, I'm in the wrong chapter. One moment, please. Because I do want to bring out the horror of it. Not trying to scare you into, into some sort of obedience, but that you will learn to properly fear the Lord and obey willingly from the heart. <clears throat> Blessings all the way through the earlier verses there of Deuteronomy 28. And finally, in verse 15, I believe it is, but it shall come to pass, if you will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord your God to do to observe to do all his commandments, his statutes, which I command you this day, that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. I'll read just a few of these. Verse 2, or rather verse uh, 16. Cursed shall you be in the city, cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your store. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body, the fruit of your land, the increase of your kind, the flocks of your sheep. Cursed shall you be when you come in. Cursed shall you be when you go out. Solid cursing. Now you think, he cannot bring this nation down? If you live the next few years, you will see that he will be able to, lead, to do that. Verse 21. He shall make the pestilence, disease epidemics, cleave unto thee until uh, he has consumed you or has consumed thee from off the land, whether you go to possess it. And he will smite you with consumption, as he told us there in Leviticus 26. But it gets down so bad finally. Um, when they come in here and take over the families, you shall betroth a wife. And another man shall lie with her. Probably one of these foreign uh, soldiers. You'll build a house. You shall not dwell therein. You shall plant a vineyard. Shall not gather the grapes therein. Your ox shall be in, slain if you are in that business. And you shall not eat thereof. Your sheep shall be given unto your enemies. And you shall have none to rescue them. It's impossible to get. You can't go down to Kroger's or the food line, food city, whatever you trade. And get a big buggy of groceries. Getting a little more increased in price, but still they're available yet. And Mr. Armstrong used to predict the time when the grocery shelves would be empty. And you think that will not change human nature. When you get hungry and you see your children cry, crying and starving, you will feel the effect of it. Go on. He will smite you with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. Going on down to um, verse 34, to be so bad you'll just lose your mind. Some people will actually lose their mind. You shall be mad for the sight of your eyes which you shall see. And he'll smite you in every other way. Shall become an astonishment and a proverb. Reading, You can read all of this later on your own. Verse 43 is very apropos for today's time. You see what's happening in this country. The stranger, that's a, a word that means Gentiles are not one of the Israelite people who were given this great land. But this Gentile that's within you, within your gates, within the confines of the country, shall get above you very high. And now we even have one in the highest office. I'm not condemning him. God says not to do that. Because there's no power except to be ordained of God. But on the other hand, in Deuteronomy 17, it says, Do not put a Gentile over you in the land that you come to possess it. But he shall get above you very high, and you shall come down very low. He'll become the lender, and you shall not lend to him. He shall be the head, and you shall be the tail. Uh, it even talks so bad, it gets so bad. Verse 54. 
well, 53 even, you shall eat the fruit of your own body. Many people do not like to hear it this strong, but I'm going to read you what God says can and will happen among certain people. The flesh of your sons and your daughters, which the Lord your God hath given you in the straightness or the siege, that a man that is tender among you, or he that is tender among you, very delicate, uh, very refined and uh, kind person, his eyes shall be evil toward his brother and toward the wife of his bosom, toward the remnant of his, of his children, which he shall leave. And he will not give unto them to eat of even these children. Human nature can get very desperate. It can turn to cannibalism, sad as it is. I'll, that, I'll not read any more in that particular area, but read it and find out what it says. Now, God gives a challenge to the house of Israel. Let's go to the book of Ezekiel now. Ezekiel was the prophet primarily sent to the house of Israel. Ezekiel 18, verse 30. <clears throat> well, they deny that God's ways are equal there in verse 29 but verse 30 therefore I will judge you O house of Israel that is speaking of this great nation of whom we love I do not wear this flag superficially if I had been old enough I would have served in that World War II army lacked about three years I love this nation it has given me such great blessings and been kind to me and kind to my generation but I will judge you, God says, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord. Repent is what God is looking for. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby you have transgressed. And they mount to high heaven, you might say. And make you a new heart and a new spirit, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Why do we keep clobbering ourselves to where God must apply the death penalty? That's according to his laws. The wages of sin is death. For I have no pleasure, verse 32, in the death of him that dieth. God doesn't want to apply this severe punishment to us, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves. This is talking about genuine heartfelt repentance. And live ye. <clears throat> now, let's go now to the great hope that I spoke earlier of, the title of the sermon, that God has promised to his people and to which this feast depicts the hope of all of us, the hope of all the world. All right, we're going back to Jeremiah now, where I told you I would read it earlier or later in the sermon. But in Jeremiah 30 now, we'll have to move pretty rapidly, I guess. Just a few pages back, if I can find it. I have a lotion there at my house that I got from... It's for people who work in banks and count money. You put it on your fingertip, and you can do it like this. Well, I could turn these pages better if I had that with me, but I don't. I'll have to lick them, sorry to say. All right, Jeremiah 30. Get the right verse here. <clears throat> the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, chapter 30, verse 1, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write all these words that I have, been, that I have spoken unto you in a book. Preserve it for future generation. Lo, the day has come, says the Lord, that I will bring again... This is the second time he's going to have to do this, as you will see. He's going to bring again, or bring back again from captivity, the captivity of my people Israel and Judah. Notice the two of them placed together here, because it has not happened that way before, as I brought out in the first sermon, about 120 or 30 years apart. The captivity is under two different uh, rulers. I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. 
And these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and concerning Judah. Keep that in mind, that that has not happened before. And talks about a man like he's having a child. In childbirth, he's in tra travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces turn into paleness? Alas, for that day is great, that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, as I mentioned before, but he shall be saved out of it. There is hope in his future. He shall be, God says directly and positively, and he will bring it about. Now then, see where I want to go from here. Verse 8. It shall come to pass in that day when he begins this procedure, and what a pitiful state they're going to be in, and we will be there hopefully to help and assist these poor decimated and people who are barely clinging to life. Some of them may be dying en route out of the camps as I brought out. And I look forward to that day. I see some of the illnesses and sicknesses around us and my heart yearns for the time when I will have the power and the mind and the love and compassion that I can reach down and touch these individuals and say be strengthened, be healed, and it will happen immediately just as Jesus Christ would do it because we are to be like him. We'll have that power, and I want to utilize that power that he's going to give me. Hopefully, I'll be included in that to help these poor, hapless, and helpless people. Now, notice it says that day is great, that none is like it. In fact, there's about four places that it gives that description that there's no other day like it. Daniel 12 and 4 has that same expression. And of course, Matthew 24, uh, one of those uh, end time prophecies, Christ tells us that. And also in, um, let me see if I can find my second page here. There's about four places that it tells us that. It's talking about the Great Tribulation or World War III is exactly what it's talking about. Going on, let's read the last verse in chapter 30. The fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he has done it. He's going to perform this captivity and then bring them out. And until he has performed the intents of his heart, and in the latter days you shall consider it. Now then, verse 31 gives us a wonderful hope that is what lies ahead of us. And so I want to more or less conclude in this area of hope. And wonderful promises from God that he will save us eventually. Chapter 31 of, of Jeremiah 31. At the same time, saith the Lord, I will be the God of all families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus saith the Lord, the people which were left in, uh, of the sword, the one who were not slain, but found grace in the wilderness, even Israel, when I went to cause them rest. This is the ancient time, but there's a dual fulfillment here. I think one of the ministers brought out there's a duality in God's prophecies most of the time. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Yes, he has given us severe punishment up till this time. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee, and I will build thee, and you shall be built, O virgin of Israel. You shall again be adorned with tabrays, musical uh, assemblies and things like that. You shall go forth in the dances of them that make merry. Yes, David was very fond of dancing, as you know. He got in trouble with his wife over it, but he loved to dance, and he must have had really good rhythm. You shall yet plant vines upon the mountains of Samaria. Now, this is the northern house here, the house of Samaria. The planter shall plant, shall eat them as common thing. There shall be a day the watchman upon the Mount Ephraim shall cry, Arise ye and let us go up to Zion unto the Lord our God. One of the reasons would be to keep the Feast of Tabernacle. Because Zechariah 14 tells us that, that all nations will come up, including Egypt, those Arabic people, they will come up and learn to keep the Feast of Tabernacle. Or else God will uh, put great punishment upon them. Goes on to say, 
Thus saith the Lord, verse 7, Sing with gladness for Jacob, shout among the chief of the nations, and we have been and are at this time. Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. What's left? Behold, I will bring them from the north country, gather them from the coasts of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame. Notice what conditions they're going to be in when we bring them out of those slave labor camps. That would provoke great compassion, I feel. The woman with child, some of them will have become impregnated despite the horrible uh, conditions there. Her that travailed with child together, a great company shall return thither. They shall come with weeping. Notice their attitude now. One of humility, one of submission, finally ready to accept the ways of God. They shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them. And I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way. They shall not stumble for I am a father to Israel and Ephraim is my firstborn. Let's see how many, much time I have left and I'll see how much I can cover on this. I hope quite a bit because this, this is the de delightful part of the sermon. The good part of the sermon. Because we've covered the bad thing that will happen because of our stubborn, stubbornness. Finally, we come down to verse uh, 31. This is the important part that is going to occur here when we bring, bring these people out of their captivity. Chapter 31 of, of uh, Jeremiah 31. Verse 31, Behold, the day has come. Not too far in the future, I don't think. They'll be in slave labor camps there for about uh, three and a half years. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. We're going to work together finally instead of opposing one another and envying one another as it's put in some places. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. That was the old covenant. And they had certain prerequisites they had to follow, including the law, of course. But certain sacrificial things were added later on, as the scriptures tell us. Which my covenant, he didn't break the covenant. He didn't break his agreement. They broke. They break. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, after their captivity and punishment. I will put my law, not just on tables of stone at this time, in their hearts. I will write it in their hearts as we have God's law written in our hearts today. We don't perform it perfectly even at, with God's spirit. But at least we have the desire there to obey God. And write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. They're always on these evangelical trips, trying to convert people who frankly cannot be converted at this time. It's not according to God's plan. No man can come to me, God, Christ said, except the Father which sent me draw him, John 6, 44. So they're wasting their time. Some get martyred over that very uh, effort. We've had one recently, and some are still in prison right now. They've accused them of being spies and whatever. But anyway, they're spinning their wheels, as we say. It's for no effect. So there won't be everyone trying to get people to know the Lord and become a part of their particular church or congregation. Now notice, for they shall all know me. Look how they come, weeping hu and with humility. They shall all know me, truly know God. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. In him. So to know God and his son Jesus Christ, truly, you've got to be keeping his commandments. That's part of the, the agreement, part of the covenant. Going on, for I will forgive their iniquity. Yes, sins have to be forgiven. And I will remember their sin no more. It will be put under the blood of Jesus Christ, as we have been, uh, had that offer. All right, let's see how much more I want to read here in this particular area. We 
We can turn to the book of Joel after Daniel over here. A couple of three books. The um, And I'll hit it in a moment. Let's see. Joel 3, and in verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. Yeah, there's going to be some decision made. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Verse 15 talks about similar things that Christ spoke of there in Matthew 24 about the heavenly signs. The Lord shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people. There in verse 16. The Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. Verse 17. So shall ye know that I am the Lord, your God dwelling in Zion. And remember uh, Zechariah 8 says, I am returned unto Zion, and Jerusalem shall be called a, a city of truth. It's as bad now as it is here in the United States over there. I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, and then shall be Jer Jerusalem shall be holy. And again, put in connection with this scripture, uh, Zechariah 8, that he's returned to Zion, to Jerusalem. And it will become the capital of this world, as we've heard many places in the sermon. Now then, this hope is expanded greatly in the New Testament. Let's turn to the New Testament, to the book of Acts. That's the physical salvation of them, bringing them out and then offering the spiritual salvation to them. But in Acts, the second chapter, and we'll pick it up in verse 26, and you know where I'm going on the day of Pentecost here. Well, let me see here if I'm in the right place. Yeah, let's read verse 26, continuing in this theme of the great hope that God is offering us at this time. But later on, it will involve all of mankind. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Now this was taken from the Psalms, and it was a prophecy about Christ, written by David. My flesh shall rest in hope, Christ, that was a prophecy. Behold, be, excuse me, because you will not leave my soul or my life, my body in hell, neither will you suffer your Holy One, that's Christ in the tomb, to see corruption. He did not corrupt. Three days and three nights. You have made known to me the ways of life. You shall make me full of joy with your countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, still dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us today. Let's see what else I want to pick up here quickly. Acts 24. I think I've got a couple of scriptures, if I can get to them here in time. They will not cut me off. Okay. Acts 24 and verse 15. God tells us in his word through the writers and have hope toward God. We can positively believe in this, put our confidence and our trust in this, which they themselves also allow that there shall be a resurrection of the dead. I hope we all have that positive hope in our mind that if we do die from whatever cause, there is a resurrection from the dead, both of the just and unjust, two different ones, but we are to have hope in that resurrection. Now then, at the return of Jesus Christ and the setting up of his kingdom, which this feast depicts, it depicts real hope for all of mankind. One final scripture of 1 Timothy 1, 1, if I can get to it. All right, 1 Timothy 1, verse 1. Paul, 
an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God, our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, Jesus Christ.